called collecting and analyzing. And I'm going to, I've given you there a, a, an indication of how the session will run. The overall purpose is to highlight the importance of data, information. It will be interactive, it will provide examples, but also put some questions out there for discussion. And I'll be illustrating uh, my ideas and I'm inviting you to think about, from your point of view, three areas of information or data. Government policy, or government statistics on educational performance. Economic data, labor market trends. It can be statistical quantitative data or it could be qualitative data from your case studies and institutional data. Anything that you've got, as I said earlier, that's relevant to your institution. And then I want to begin, but this will carry on tomorrow, thinking about what that data means for developing your own institutional approaches to employability and uh, enterprise. So, my first question really, why is data important? Why do we need it? Well, for the planning. For planning? What, well, how does it help us plan? We a good network so that we can implement in our field. So, Data provides networks. The first stage of uh, networking will be the data, data collection. Okay. I think we have to have some good information which can be used. Yeah. Quality information. I'm still trying to get this idea of how networking will facilitate quality information because you'll be drawing on different sources through the network. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah. Data means what happened in the future. In my opinion, data means available data means what happened in the future. If you can get the past, what happened in the past. If you get the data, then if you play about it, then how can we achieve the goal? Yeah. To make the future plan, yeah. data is required. If you don't have data, then how can you go ahead? Yes, yeah, so data. Yeah. Data provides, data provides uh, if historical data provides trends, doesn't it? It shows you where things are heading. So you can anticipate the future. Anything else? For the management side, the physics and making data. Yes. Yes. So it's a, an important tool for management. I don't know if any of you in management have ever gone with a plan and um, staff have said to you, what, what, what's, what are you doing? What, what, what's the basis for your decision? Where's the evidence to support your decision? So it's a very important uh, instrument for making a case for organizational change and development. Yeah. And it's also important for setting targets because you have to know where you stand so that you can know how far you have to go. Yes, good. <laughs> so there's a before and after. You need to know the before. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I think there is three. Before, now, now. Yes. So the before might be the historic trends. Now is a moment in time. And where do we want to get to? So thinking about the university here, where you've been historically, where you are now, and where you see yourselves in the future. To fix that destination. Hmm? To fix that destination of Yes, good. I will uh, circulate these slides after the presentation, but I think it's really important that you know I'm going to have to add to these slides on the basis of your comments. So I will amend them and edit them on the basis of your comments and send them back to you.
so these were some of my ideas. Um, so as, as you said, it's, it helps inform discussions and sets priorities and objectives. It provides a rationale for resource allocation. And I think as well, it provides accountability to stakeholders. If you're explaining why you've done something to an employer or to a student, they have the right to know, don't they, on what basis you've made that decision. So it's uh, important in terms of uh, developing transparency in your decision making. So this is a kind of process, simplistic process, through data, knowledge to action. So I want to start with the first of my areas of data collection, government policies. And I've added to that government policies if there is, in your country, uh, nationally collected data on educational performance that you might want to use as um, a, a kind of setting the context within which you will be developing your plans. There may be some very relevant areas of government policy. There may be some very relevant bits of performance data that you need to take account of in your planning. So I just picked these up from the case studies. That there were others, but and these are the non-European case studies. Um, so uh, the, the SRU, sorry, I can't remember. Yes. Yeah, uh, Siren. So this was one I picked up from your case study, was that the um, government had prioritised HR development in science and technology. So that was a, a key reference point for developments in software training and so on, at, at the case study that, that I remember you used. Um, we, we, we plan to... Uh, and expand it? Yeah, expand our... Okay. So, that's an example of one bit of data that's been used as a kind of reference point, as a point of departure for a development um, in Spain Ren. And then the uh, Spatial Data Network, the SDN project. Who knows about that more than I do? You do? No? Anybody from Fang Long? Well, who's, who's from Taiwan? Me and the Do you know about this? Software training. We, uh, software training, as I remember from reading the case study. So these were taken from the good practice. We case uh, tried to use some uh, online tool to gather the survey from the uh, the alumni, the graduated students, and when the, we get the response, we analyze them to uh, decide whether which direction we need to go further in this project. And. Actually, uh, we are coming here to discuss... Sorry, I can't hear you, there's noise outside. Okay. Um, uh, we have some uh, response from our graduate student. Right. Yes, from the survey we make using online tools. We okay. send them via email. Okay. And then we get the response and we analyze it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's good. Can we come yeah. back to that? Yes. Because um, I want to look at exactly that kind of data shortly. Um, I, I included this one because I think this was a, a project in software training that came from a, a government initiative, but I can't remember the details now, and you can't, you're not aware of that. Okay. 
let me just give you an example that I do know a bit more about from the UK. But as I said earlier, what I want you to do is to think about, well, you know, this isn't the UK, but what, what's relevant in my, in my country? What, what government policies currently are relevant for me, for you? So I just wanted to say very briefly something about a, a bill that's going through Parliament at the moment that will become law. It's called the Higher Education and Research Bill. And it's a response, as most laws are, a response to what are considered to be a series of concerns or problems in the sector. And in the case of the UK, the problems that have been identified by the government are that courses are inflexible, that we have skill shortages in science and engineering, technology and maths, which we shorten, abbreviate to call STEM subjects, and that we need to strengthen our capabilities in research and innovation. So the bill then provides some practical solutions to these problems. The first is that the government is developing an apprenticeship scheme. Are people familiar with apprenticeships? Who, is, who isn't? Who doesn't know what an apprenticeship is? Because I can briefly explain it. What do you think it is? Okay, it's um. Do you do, you, do you have apprenticeships? In? It's 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 another form of, of work-based learning. It's it's a, a, a company or or a, a public sector body will recruit somebody as an apprentice who will then, as part of their apprenticeship, train. And they will train with a university. But the idea is that the training, the training will be employer-led. So they will be the, the employer will be responsible for organising and liaising with the university to develop a programme that's relevant to the needs of the employer. So you can see there the response to skill shortages and to inflexible courses. One response has been the development of apprenticeships. And the other that I thought I'd mention in the UK we have, a, at the moment, a series of discrete research councils for arts and humanities, science and engineering, social sciences. In the future, they're going to be coordinated by a central <coughs> UK research institute. And the reason for that is because they want research in the UK to be much more applied to the needs of business and the economy and they want research to be across disciplines so they want research to be interdisciplinary so the idea of bringing all the research councils together under one umbrella is to support the commercialization of research So that's very important for universities in the UK. Some major changes. There was one I wanted to mention because I think Yuli mentioned it this morning. The UK runs degrees, three year undergraduate degrees. Another proposal in this uh, bill is that we will run two year degrees. Why do you think they want us to run two-year degrees? To make money. To save. To save. Mm? To, to save. save. 
it's partly it's partly that. I think it's also uh, uh, so the rhetoric goes that they want students in and out as quickly as possible, so that they can then be there as work as part of the workforce. So instead of spending a long time doing a degree, the idea is that you'll do it in two years and you'll walk, work over the summer holidays. So you'll have a kind of crash degree course and finish in two years. So I suspect it will meet the European requirements, although it won't matter when we leave the EU. But the idea is that you'll do your degrees in a shorter period of time and that will support uh, the needs of the economy. I'll come back to the implications of that for university strategies like London Met shortly. Key changes in the job market. So I'm moving now from government policy and performance data to look at changes in your labour market. And again, I just found two examples from your case studies. One from uh, Tang Long, and the other one from the Mongolia National University. Training dental assistants, and, uh, oh, and the University of Da Nang's links with uh, an auto corporation. Does anybody want to mention say a little bit more about any of those? Anybody involved in those from the universities there? Tang Long? Mongolian National? Yes, please. Okay. Just, yes, just if you want to say a little bit more about the um, the initiative that within the with the dental assistance. Yes. So, all university just uh, have you know very uh, good network with the with the many private clinics. So, what they my demand is the very good assistant. So that's why the university decided to set up the dental assistant course for the for the necessity of the private clinics. So we just created new system. Which is a brand new in Mongolia, which is the quite fulfilling the necessity of the private uh, enterprise. Where did that initiative come from? Actually, initiative is just matching interest between two the private clinics and also the university want to create more qualified professionals. But there are certain things against the many qualified uh, people to really seriously carry out the job. And, and was there a, um, information or data that, that was brought to your attention in the university which indicated the shortage of this area of. Yeah, actually, the data indicates that we have the quite good, uh, exceeding number of the dentists, but the dental auxiliary was very long. Which is a very, uh, you know, contradicting. It's too many professionals, but other side there is missing many, many the assistants. Assistant. So that was the uh, point to be so used to conduct this new course. Good. So very good. Thank you very much. It's a very good example, isn't it, of data information about labor shortages and actually in that case a surplus of supply in terms of dentists where the university was able to respond to that through to the development of a training program for dental nurses dental assistants what about the other two can anybody talk about those no They're in your, um, they're in our good study, good practice case studies. Um, nobody from Darnay? 
Yeah. Do you do, do you know anything about this um, no, the link? <coughs> the University of Penang have a good collaborations with the Zhuhai Open companies. So um, um, annually, um, the Nang University uh, sends a, a large amount of uh, students to um, to high school trainings and um, also to high school company um, go to the the Nang University to, um, to to seek for and uh, recruit uh, uh, the good student. Yeah. And do you know where that how that originated that partnership? Where did it come from? Who approached who? Um, I think it was the Yeah. 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 Right. So did the initiative come from the auto company approaching the university? Yeah. Is that how it worked? And they provided them of evidence and information and, and they wanted training for their staff, but they also were interested in recruiting the best of your students. Yes. Yeah. Good, okay. So some of these um, initiatives that uh, that you describe are sometimes quite seemingly quite um, random. They happen through some chance contact. Uh, they provide you with an opportunity to develop a relationship with a local employer, as in your case. One that needs training for their workforce, but also are interested in recruiting your brightest and best students. So there's the beginning of a relationship, a partnership, which may well help to shape your curriculum in the university. How can you make your curriculum responsive to the needs of this particular area of employment? So that's a question really that's come out of that relationship and your employability strategy, in a sense, will build on those kinds of partnerships. What do they mean for your curriculum? How can you involve the employers more in the design of your curriculum, even in the assessment of your curriculum? So there are lots of questions there that you could take, and you could then use that model as a basis for developing partnerships with other employers. Which you may have already done. I think um, Trường Hải uh, um, can you speak up? I think uh, Trường Hải will set a specific uh, criteria for um, my university uh, to um, to adjust the curriculum uh, uh, for the student that they require. Oh, so they actively influence the the, the shape of yeah. the curriculum. Can you say in what kinds of ways do you, do you know? Well, how did they influence it? What were some of the changes? Mm. I'm sorry. You don't know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry, I've got this on the screen here. I'm not quite sure. I must have pressed something. Maybe if you just press those, can you press those? Uh, no, I don't, I don't know what they hide all. Thank you. Let me give you some examples again from the UK, the kind of data that uh, London Met and the sector as a whole, university sector as a whole, has been taken 
uh, and thinking about and informing their planning on employability. So the, fir the first thing to say is that um, non-graduates are much more likely to be unemployed. So we say this to our prospective applicants. Um, and degree holders, um, that should have a sterling pound sterling, 12,000 pounds on average, more than their non-degree counterparts. So that's an important, if you like, um, premium that graduates gain through being a university graduate. They earn more and they're more likely to be employed. That's UK data that may or may not be the case in your countries. There's been a significant decline in manufacturing in the UK and an increase in service sector jobs. The public sector has also declined, except very briefly in 2008 to 9, when some banks became part of the public sector as part of the economic crisis. But other than that, there's been a trend of decline, although public sector vacancies are still one of the most important areas of recruitment for the graduate workforce. An interesting figure here, and going back to the talk this morning about enterprises, is the number of jobs that were created in small business startups. That's a very high percentage of vacancies in the economy. The vast majority of them are in small and medium-sized enterprises. What does that mean for the curriculum? I think it must mean that we need to look at the enterprise curriculum, the kind of ideas that Alex was talking about this morning. Innovation, entrepreneurship, the kind of business skills required. And the small and medium-sized enterprises don't have to be for-profit enterprises. They can be uh, social enterprises. They can be, actually, they can be uh, charities. But they require, they're small, and they require a workforce that understands innovation, critical thinking, independent thinking, as well as business skills like finance management, marketing, HR, and so on. So that suggests there that there's a set of skills that the university needs to take account of in its curriculum planning. You see, the biggest increase, and this is what we were saying earlier, isn't it? You've got to look at the trends in order to predict the future. And here you can see the biggest increase in vacancies are in accounting and professional services, banking and finance, consulting, IT and communications. So if you're thinking about a curriculum, that's responding to the trends out there in the labour market, those might be the areas of curriculum that you need to look at. What are you currently doing in those areas? That's a question from my university. So, I guess I've given you some taste of um, labour market trends in, in uh, the UK, and we've used a couple of examples from your qualitative case studies. Can anybody, um, any of the facts from the UK situation uh, ring true for you in terms of your own countries, or are there different trends in terms of the labour market in your national economies or regionally? What are the headlines, really, that you would uh, say a uh, uh, kind of relevant and important to think about in terms of your planning. <laughs>